Hey, what's up YouTube? Today I'm going to show you how I built this Niagara-based circling vultures effect. Now, this isn't a step-by-step -step tutorial, right? More a sort of breakdown, and this is quite an advanced effect, so a decent Niagara knowledge is probably required here. I'll first go over the entire Niagara system, and then I'll talk briefly about the material setup as well. Let's get started. Alright, now when trying to build a somewhat complex Niagara system, it's always great to first identify your needs and have in mind a clear list of the desired features. So let's do that right away. First, we want to have birds circling around a given point. We also want to somewhat randomize the bird's movement within that circle. We want to have birds roll a bit when they turn. We want to have birds dive every now and then to gain some speed and keep some of that speed to glide for a moment. We want to prevent birds from going too high or too low. We want to control the birds' orientation so they climb horizontally unless they still have some speed from a dive. And finally, we want to make birds flap their wing when gliding every now and then, right? And definitely when climbing up, but not when diving. Cool, that should be enough to get us started. We'll keep the effect somewhat simple, so no obstacle avoidance, no self-collision avoidance, okay? Alright, so building such effect in Niagara can definitely be daunting, right? Like, where to start? Well, it always helps to break down a complex problem into a subset of smaller problems. Ultimately, here we just want to move particles around, right? So we'd like to compute a velocity, and a velocity is really just a normalized direction multiplied by a speed factor, right? So right away we can think in terms of direction and speed, which are two separate things. And for that particular effect, we can even go further and first figure out our direction in 2D space, and then worry about our direction in Z. And that's precisely what I did here, with those two modules. But actually, let's first focus on that curl noise force module. It's used to sample some very low frequency noise, which I used to somewhat randomize particles' movement direction. However, note that this module is configured to do nothing. It's not writing any value at all, because I actually don't want to move the particles based on that noise force. I'm really just interested in the noise vector it produces, which is accessible via that vector it outputs. Also, this noise vector is usually sampled from a 3D noise texture at the particle's position. However, I want to sample a very low frequency noise to only slightly offset the bird's movement direction, right? And the thing is, using a very low frequency essentially scales up the 3D noise texture, okay? And so nearby particles may sample very similar noise vectors, and I don't want that. I want to have particles move not only randomly, but also differently from each other. And to fix this, I created a very simple dynamic input script that still uses the particle's position, but to which I add an offset multiplied by the particle index. Now, this is quite an arbitrary solution, but essentially this allows me to have particles sample a very unique and very low frequency noise while still being nearby in world space. Hopefully that made sense. Anyway, that noise vector is then sent to my compute direction modules here and here. In that first module, I first get the particle's position and convert it from whatever space it's currently in, depending on the emitter setting, to local space. It's used to compute a 2D direction and a 2D distance from the particle's position to the emitter center. Here, using that 2D distance, I compute a 0 to 1 alpha value. Then here, this isn't mandatory, but I sample a float curve to have a sort of multiplier used to vary how much new direction I will add to the particle's current direction. This is to somewhat randomize the emitter and flock behavior a bit, right? So the particles don't all change direction at the same rate. The thing is, I don't want to have every single particle sample that curve at the same time, right? And that randomness will be synced across all particles. Ideally, I'd want some sort of looping time, but uniquely offset per particle. To do that, well, I can simply use the emitter's age and offset it by that material random value. Which is, if you take a look at the initialized particles module, a random 0 to 1 value per particle set once, which is exactly what I'm looking for. So a first particle might start here on that curve, march forward and loop on and on, right? While a second particle might do the same thing, but start maybe here. Cool, now here I build a new 2D direction. First I use that random direction vector, which is that curl noise force vector, right? and I lerp it with the direction to the emitter center based on that distance alpha value. 
So essentially a particle's direction is somewhat randomized until it gradually reaches the distance limit to the emitter, at which point it's asked to move towards the emitter center. And that's the circling behavior in a nutshell. That new direction is made to be frame rate independent using delta time and is added to the current 2D direction and the sum of those two vectors is normalized. At this point it's stored in a local variable to let me compare the two, the current 2D direction and the new one, and to compute a delta value using a simple dot product and a sign to let me know if the new direction makes a particle turn clockwise or counterclockwise. Now I want to have access to those variables outside that module for later use, so they both are output variables. And then I apply that new 2D direction. For the z-direction, well, again, I transform the particle's position to local space and derive a minus 1 to 1 alpha value based on that local z-position. If the particle is leveled with the emitter, that alpha value is 0, 1 if it's at the maximum altitude, and minus 1 if at the minimum altitude. That alpha value is then converted for later use to some sort of frame rate independent multiplier using delta time and some arbitrary strain value, so I can decide if I want that altitude constraint to kick in super fast or be very smooth and gradual. Here I compute the new z direction, again based on that curl noise force vector, but I only care about its z component, which is added to the particle's current z direction. I clamp it to ensure that a particle cannot climb straight up or dive straight down because that's not particularly physically plausible when it comes to birds and it causes some glitches when computing the mesh orientation so I make sure to constrain that and kill two birds in one stone, pun intended. And to actually apply the altitude constraint, well, I gradually fed out that new z direction if positive and if a particle is near the maximum altitude limit or if negative and if a particle is near the minimum altitude limit and that's the z direction. So you see, the overall movement direction mostly comes from that curl noise force vector. It's just constrained by an altitude limiter in z to make a particle go down if too high or go up if too low, and a distance limiter in x and y to make a particle go towards the emitter center if too distant from it. Moving on, here I have a simple module to combine those two separate direction components into a single safely normalized 3D vector and that's the final movement direction. Now let's figure out the speed at which a particle moves in that direction. So here I have a float value that is incremented or decremented based on the z-movement direction and gravity. That way, if a particle moves downward, that float value is increased with gravity, and if it moves upward, it's decreased by the same amount. It's essentially a freefall speed, right? It's limited by a maximum speed limit, and I output a normalized value for later use, based on that limit, so 0 if a particle has no freefall speed at all, and 1 if it has reached its maximum value. That freefall speed is also decreased with some drag, because a particle could actually dive, gain some speed and then level up for a while, and it would maintain that extra speed indefinitely, right? That float value here wouldn't be increased nor decreased, hence needing a drag value. Here, just like with the 2D direction, I sample a curve to somewhat randomize the default max speed. It's not necessary, but it adds a bit of randomness to the picture. And then our final movement speed is based on a max speed I can tweak, plus that extra freefall speed. So a particle is at least moving by some amount, more or less varied by that curve, plus that extra speed that it gains by diving and losing with both drag and when going up. And now that I have both a direction and a speed, I have a velocity and I can simply apply it by adding the usual solve forces and velocity module, and particles are moving. There's a few extra bits left to do though. One is to compute how much roll to apply. To do that I make use of both the direction delta and delta sign that module outputs. Mm, here, right? And again that tells me how much a particle is changing its 2D direction and in which direction, left or right. Then here, again, I sample a float curve to add a bit of randomized roll. Kinda like the bird is fighting some wind burst and needs to fight a bit to stay level, right? It's really just extra details. The actual roll amount is computed here and is interpolated from its current value to a target value, which is, well, based on how much a particle is changing direction, plus that pseudo-randomized extra roll. It's multiplied by quite a bit because the direction delta is super small and that's also why I smooth it, as it's quite jittery. That roll value is used in that module, which computes burn mesh orientation. Now, we could orient the particles toward the velocity, but here we actually want to have complete control over that. So obviously a particle should face its movement direction. 
But here I mitigate the direction Z component to only actually allow a particle to pitch upward if it has some extra free fall speed. Most often I think birds are pretty leveled, even when they climb, so that's why I'm trying to control here. The second axis used to build the mesh orientation quaternion comes from a cross product with a forward axis and an up vector, but I actually offset the resulting side vector upward or downward based on that roll. And that's how the actual roll effect is applied. The final custom module here is used to drive the materials animation using dynamic parameters. So I have an animation time and animation strength. Time is simply increased by delta time multiplied by some speed scale factor and also slightly more based on the positive z direction. Kinda like the bird is flapping its wing faster the more it tries to climb. Here I sample a curve, again used to somewhat randomize the animation strength and give some variation to the effect. Animation strength that is computed here. Once more, I use the movement direction Z component to increase that strength the more a particle goes up, and I make sure to have it set to zero when it goes down, meaning a bird is diving and I want to prevent it from having any wing animation at all. And that is sent to the mesh material using the dynamic material parameter here. For the material, well, I mostly use the technique shared by Matt Nava a while ago. I'll have the Twitter thread linked in the video description below. Basically, once you have modeled your bird in your favorite 3D software, you build poses and take 2D snapshots of the vertices positions using UVs. Here I use Blender, so I use the data transfer modifier to copy the UV maps from the pose meshes to the master mesh using topology mode. And then those extra UV maps are used in engine, kinda like shape keys or morph targets, to create an animation using a curve asset to blend in and out those poses. Here I kept it somewhat simple and built only two poses that I fade in and out with an extra delay along the wings. Now those poses are 2D snapshots, right? So the original vertex position on the forward axis is kept as is here, and I only build the animation on the two remaining axes, if that makes sense. Also, usually I tend to work in local space first and then rebuild the world position from scratch. I've made another video that dives deep into this kind of world position offset tricks, so feel free to give it a watch if you want more details. Anyway, once I have my bird animated in local space, I transform that vertex position from mesh to world space. That will essentially move and orient vertices based on the particle's position and orientation, and then I subtract the original world position to convert that position to an offset, and voila! The wing animation here could be better, but oh well, it was good enough for me. And that's it, files are available as a tier 1 reward on my Patreon, so if you want to take a closer look at that effect, well, feel free to join in. Thanks for your support, thanks for watching, and thanks to all my Patreon supporters. I hope you found that video useful, don't forget to like and subscribe. I'll see you in the next video, take care of yourself, bye bye!